the most feared corporate raider in the world. One of the shrewdest investors on the planet. He moves markets by the mere mention of his name. You have a bombshell today from short seller Hindenburg Research, which is revealing a new short position against Carl Icahn's IEP. Fortune magazine says he may be making more money for shareholders than anyone else on the planet. On October 31st, 2012, Carl Icahn announced that he had purchased a 10% stake in Netflix. This was really a Halloween spook for Netflix, as Icahn was someone that you didn't want anywhere near your company. People like Icahn constantly assure you that, oh, it's just a passive investment, I'm not trying to take over the company. And then, boom, you get sued for depicting Cleopatra as black. Wait, uh, never mind, wrong result. Boom, Icon shows up with enough money to buy you out, cash. Back in 2012, this wasn't even that hard, as Netflix was only worth four to five billion dollars, which was nothing for Carl Icon. He had orchestrated eight billion dollar buyouts way back in the 80s, so four billion in 2012 was child's play. With a net worth of $21 billion, he could literally buy out Netflix with a personal loan, and that was probably what he was planning on doing it, despite his hollow promises. Netflix's executive team would scramble trying to find a way to fend off this bully, and they would end up implementing a defense called the poison pill. The poison pill could be somewhat effective, but it was by no means a foolproof defense. All Netflix could do though was nervously wait and hope that they don't hear about another purchase. But weeks went by, months went by, and full years went by. No new purchases. In fact, Icon would even go ahead and sell off his entire stake by mid-2015. Had the poison pill really worked? Had Netflix just fended off the infamous Carl Icon? No way Icon was actually being honest about his passive intentions, right? Well, probably not, and I don't think he was put off by the poison pill either. The reality is that Icon had lost his mojo. While his net worth had gone up over the years, his days in power toying with Fortune 10 companies were long gone. And it wasn't just Icon who was in this situation either. Corporate raiders as a whole had lost their power. Back in the days, these guys were the worst nightmares of small companies and their shareholders. With financing from Wall Street, raiders would march into random companies where they were not welcome and buy out a large portion of the company if not the entire company. After that, they would go on to fire a large portion of the workforce, increase efficiency no matter the cost, and bolster the stock price through any means possible. Once the company has been milked, raiders will happily sell off the remaining pulp to some random sucker before moving on to their next victim. This was the brash and ruthless job of being a corporate raider. But while this was no doubt a nasty job, it was also lucrative. Till recently, Icon was worth over $20 billion. But today, he's fighting against accusations that he's been running a Ponzi, which has crushed his net worth down to just under $8 billion. So here's the insane story of how Icon went from playing with Fortune 10 companies to being accused of fraud. Taking a look back, corporate rating does not have an extensive history like stock buybacks or dual class stock. It rose in popularity during an era and then disappeared shortly after. There were a few instances of corporate raiding throughout the late 1960s, but corporate raiding didn't really become a thing until Carl Icahn. Icahn started off as nothing more than an average kid born in 1946 to a Jewish family in Brooklyn, New York. His family was squarely in the middle class, with both of Icahn's parents being school teachers. But this didn't hold him back from getting into Princeton University and graduating with a degree in philosophy in 1957. At first, it seems that he wanted to be a doctor, as he would enroll in the NYU School of Medicine, but he would end up dropping out and joining the military reserve forces. He would follow this up with a traditional job on Wall Street as a stockbroker in 1961. Here, he would learn the ins and outs of stocks, options, bonds, warrants, and other financial products before opening his own company called Icon & Company in 1968. From the very beginning, Icon was especially interested in leveraging market inefficiencies, but 
he was by no means buying out entire companies. Rather, his company was focused on something called arbitrage trading. This is basically when you make money by leveraging discrepancies in market pricing between different markets and exchanges. For example, Tesla stock might be worth $100 on TD Ameritrade, but be worth $101 on Robinhood. In this case, it would make sense to buy Tesla stock on TD and then instantly sell the stake on Robinhood. You would only make $1 per share, but if you did this with 100,000 shares, well then, you're making serious money. That's just an example though, as it's not nearly that easy. Such blatant pricing discrepancies are extremely rare. You'd be lucky to find a 5 or 10 cent discrepancy on popular stocks. But you'll have a much better chance if you look deeper than just common stock. For example, you could look at the debt market. Many companies issue bonds that can be converted to stock at a set ratio. So theoretically, you could buy a Tesla convertible bond and convert it into 10 shares of Tesla stock. If your all-in cost for the bond is less than the current price of 10 Tesla shares, well then, you're golden you can just sell the 10 shares and make money. This is precisely how Icon made his initial money. He was constantly looking for discrepancies between options, preferred stock, common stock, bonds, warrants, and mutual funds. He was constantly converting between these assets to generate a profit. Many people aren't big fans of market arbitrage as they see people like Icon as bottom feeders. They basically scrape by and make a bunch of money without adding any real value to the world. The argument against this would be that arbitragers make markets more efficient. But I don't think Icon was too concerned about justifying his means to anyone, as it wasn't long until he jumped into something much more controversial. Much of the popularity of corporate rating throughout the 70s and 80s can be explained by the economic environment. Interest rates were extraordinarily high at up to 19%. At first glance, this might sound like a great thing as you can just store your cash in a savings account and earn a Warren Buffett level returns until you consider inflation. Inflation also reached up to 15%, so rarely were you making any sort of real return. This didn't just apply to savings accounts either. Whether you were looking at real estate or stocks or gold or index funds, chances were high that there was no real return. This made investors especially desperate and risk tolerant. They were willing to do just about anything, including piling into junk bonds. In fact, between 1979 and 1989, the junk bond market exploded from $10 billion to $189 billion. But our man Icon had a much better pitch for investors. Given that people were shying away from stocks, the market had stagnated for about 10 years and many blue chip stocks were heavily discounted. This was a great opportunity for value investors like Warren Buffett, but Icon didn't stop at just investing in these value companies. Icon would purchase a controlling share or the entire company and he would quote unquote, optimize the company. By optimize, he would basically strip these companies down to their bare bones and eliminate anything that wasn't generating a profit. This might not sound too bad until you realize just what he was eliminating. For example, he might go in and kill a company's R&D department or their safety department. This would make the company more profitable than ever for the next three to five years, but after that, they're absolutely screwed. This was none of Icon's concern though, as he would have already flipped the business by this point. So essentially, Icon and his fellow corporate raiders were basically going around and ruining companies for personal gain. Icon's first target was an appliance company called Tappan. He would acquire a controlling stake in the company in 1978 and do some gutting. He would then force the company to be sold to Electrolux, netting him a gross profit of $2.7 million or a 100% return. With a taste of success, Icon would quickly jump up to playing with the tens of millions. In 1983, for example, he would acquire ACF Industries and flip it to Philips Petroleum in 1985 for a $50 million profit. At least with these two instances, Icon was simply flipping these companies. In other instances, he would straight up blackmail these companies as was the case with Saxon Industries. Icon bought a stake in Saxon in 1980 and threatened that he was going to find someone to buy the entire company. This forced the company to buy out Icon shares, which netted him a quick $2 million. 
Seeing this, there was no doubt that Icon was wreaking havoc quite early on, but no one really fought him. The companies that he was going after were no-name brands with not much support. Surely, he couldn't pull this off with a true giant, or at least that's what they thought until he did. In 1985, Icon would pull together all of his investors' funds and max out his bank credit lines to purchase a 20% stake in Transworld Airlines for approximately $70 million. Most of you probably aren't familiar with Transworld Airlines or TWA, well, because Icon would run it to the ground, but we'll get to that. When Icon purchased his stake, TWA was the fourth largest airline in the US. In fact, their planes alone were worth over a billion dollars, which was massive stuff for 1985. This isn't to say that they were perfect though, they were dealing with issues with unions and trying to stage a turnaround. But Icon's presence ensured that this turnaround never came. Just a few months after his initial purchase, Icon would up his stake to just over 50%, which gave him control of TWA. And a few years later, Icon would take TWA completely private, upping his stake to 90%. During a normal corporate turnaround, businesses would focus on eliminating the bad parts of the business and doubling down on the good parts, but Icon would do the exact opposite. He would eliminate the good parts of the business by selling them off. For example, he would sell off their popular London routes to American Airlines for $445 million. Pretty soon, TWA had nothing left but losses, and they would unsurprisingly file for bankruptcy in early 1992 with $540 million in debt. This didn't really matter for Icon though, as he had already secured $469 million worth of profit for himself. The story of TWA definitely made some waves on the news cycles back in the 80s, but it wasn't Icon that really turned everyone against corporate raiders. That honor actually goes to one of Icon's biggest rivals, T. Boone Pickens. In the early 1980s, Pickens would launch a hostile takeover against Gulf Oil. This was absolutely unprecedented because Gulf Oil wasn't just a massive company, they were straight up a Fortune 10 company. Fortunately, the Standard Oil Company of California, or Chevron, was able to step in and buy out the entire company for $13 billion, which prevented Pickens from wreaking any havoc. But while this did salvage Gulf Oil, it also gave Pickens a profit of $760 million. Pretty soon, Icon was also playing with mega billion dollar companies. In 1986, for example, he launched an $8 billion takeover of US Steel. He never succeeded in taking over the entire company, but that didn't stop him from making a cool $200 million. His biggest profit, however, came in 1989 when he sold his $2 billion stake in Texaco for a $700 million profit. Things had gone way too far, and enough was enough. These tycoons were playing around with Fortune 10 and Fortune 100 companies as if they were lemonade stands. Companies were understandably not just annoyed, but triggered, and pretty soon, they would start fighting back. One of the first defenses that came about against corporate raiders was the poison pill defense. You may have heard about this with Twitter, as they were indeed using this defense. This defense basically consists of diluting the corporate raider into oblivion by issuing a crap ton of shares. This way, the corporate raider is never able to acquire majority control of the company through the public markets. This is actually how Netflix defended themselves against Icon. Right after Icon purchased a 10% stake in Netflix, Netflix would adopt a poison pill defense. This may have been successful at preventing Icon from buying out Netflix, but this didn't stop Icon from making $800 million nonetheless. Though he would have made $40 billion if he just held on. Anyway, Another popular strategy that companies adopted was golden parachutes. This doesn't actually do anything to save the company or shareholders, but it does save the executives. Essentially, golden parachutes allow for executives to walk away with massive payouts if the company gets acquired. Twitter's executives, for example, walked away with over $100 million in severance. To be honest, I wouldn't call this a defense. This is more of a case of executives saving their asses. A more traditional defense though is the white knight defense. 
We briefly touched on this actually with Gulf Oil and T-Boone Pickens. Remember how Gulf Oil sold themselves to Chevron to avoid Pickens? That's a white knight defense, selling yourself to a friendly party to avoid a takeover from a hostile party. There are a bunch of other defenses as well like the green mail defense and the employee stock ownership defense. And many of these have been used to successfully defend companies from Texaco and Gucci to Netflix and Twitter. But none of these strategies really took down corporate rating. Sure, they made corporate rating harder, but they by no means made it impossible or non-lucrative. Heck, the richest man in the world today, Bernard Arno, made most of his fortune by rating the fashion industry throughout the 80s and 90s. And Elon literally just did one with Twitter, so it's definitely still possible. But then, why has corporate rating become so rare? Well, the primary reason is because investors walked away. Back in the late 1900s, making a 100% return within 3 or 4 years was unheard of. But thanks to tech stocks, it's been largely normalized. This isn't to say that a 100% return within 3 to 4 years isn't a phenomenal return. It is a phenomenal return, but there's simply far more opportunities to make such returns. Meta, for example, has recovered nearly 200% within the past 6 months itself. So why be the villain, destroy companies, and take on so much risk when you can just bet on up-and-coming blue-chip companies and make the same or even better returns with far less stress? The answer is no reason at all. All of the people who would have backed someone like Icon in the 80s have simply turned to backing someone like Zuckerberg or Pitchay or Bitcoin. And that right there is what truly killed corporate rating. Today, Icon is being plagued with a completely new controversy. At the beginning of May, Hindenburg Research accused that Icon has been paying out dividends using funds from new investors. And given that Hindenburg has a pretty good track record from taking down Nikola Motors to taking down the Adani Group, it's very possible that these accusations are indeed legitimate, but only time will tell. In the end, corporate rating was an invention that came from investors' desire for outsized returns over everything else. This allowed for several raiders to rise to prominence who played with billion-dollar companies on a regular basis as they made billions for themselves and their investors. Eventually though, companies started catching on and started fighting back with varying levels of success. There's also an argument to be made that banks became more reluctant to lend to corporate raiders as a lot of raiders simply failed. But really, the bigger trend that killed off corporate raiding was the rise of tech. Investors simply found a new shiny thing to invest in. Why flip appliance and oil companies when you can bet on tech companies that reach billions of people? And that is what marked the end of the hunt for Carl Icahn, the infamous legend who tried to buy Netflix. Do you think some companies deserve to be rated? If you do, comment those companies down below. Also, drop a like to pay respects to all of the companies that Icon destroyed. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community, suggest future video ideas, and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.